I started at Dudley High School, and of course Dudley High School was <laughs> considered a very fine school at that time. Dudley High School was a very nice brick building. It was fairly well equipped, and it was much better than the schools at which I had worked prior to that. There were a number of things, of course, since I had had other experience that I could tell that there was a great difference in the different schools in the system. We had, at that time, parents who were very cooperative. The students were different at that time, of course, and there was not a lot of discipline because if you remember, Dolly, I don't know whether you were old enough to, but the teachers had to visit the homes of the students at that time. And you had to become familiar with your parents. And it always made for a good interaction with the student. The whole school system had the same type of curriculum. In order to finish high school, of course, you had to have the same type of curriculum. All your, although at that time you were not going to the schools, North Carolina, the University of North Carolina and those schools, but generally the schools, most of them had the same types of entrance and you would have to have the same thing. Well, it, it didn't sort of quite happen. What, what happened was we just became terribly interested. We decided that two of us who had, had youngsters in the public school system um, should see how we could help. And um, as we talked again to some of the major people we had spoke, spoken to in our initial interviews, we realized that there were several ways in which we could help the public schools be, as lay people and as parents. And um, the, the desegregation plans were, were evolving and developing at that point, and people were very nervous. And we saw that they needed help, and we tried to get them the help that they needed. It is almost 10 years since the Supreme Court order outlawing segregation in the public schools. And Mrs. Hayes said the school board did little or nothing in that time to comply with it. Well, like all communities, the climate is so important. The attitude of people, parents and ministers and whatnot, the attitude is so important. The attitude is reflected in, in the way you go about things. You had a lot of people who uh, did not accept it. And of course, they would try to influence the school board to delay and to circumvent. The Supreme Court has indicated that desegregation is the primary consideration for the board to look at. However, we have all realized that although the Supreme Court has given us the responsibility to further desegregate our schools, none of us is willing to put a child second. Therefore, we hope that all people of Greensboro feel as we do, that we must not at any time do anything to upset the foundation of education we offer our children. The process we went through when we were beginning to study the schools was to develop a list of questions and talk to every top administrator in the system, visit as many, then, then ask them you know, specific questions about the school system and how it worked, about the Board of Education, how it worked. And after we had done that, we, we saw some kind of interesting things, we decided to go to the schools and talk to principals and then to teachers. And um, um, out of it, we found, you know, a, and a list of, uh, we developed a list of uh, major challenges and um, started to get involved in what we thought were the major challenges. And at that point, we saw that purging desegregation was going to be the main one. And as a result of that study, you know, we had to get involved in the, we did get, want to become involved in the process of desegregating the schools. They had a group, a uh, conservative group. I remember we would come out of a school board meeting, Father Brown, I believe his name was, uh, Walt Johnson himself would come out of me, he spit on us. <laughs> Uh, you know, niggas around here trying to bring me vice and blood, this type of attitude. It was not widespread, but you had this, uh, this attitude was reflected among some of the people. So naturally, a student's going to pick up some of this attitude in schools. 
I think if the climate, like I said in Raleigh, if the climate was right, the parents had the right attitude, uh, you know, you, you would not have the attitude of students that some of students have had reflected of parents. So I think, say, I think the same thing happened here, basically, that uh, some parents had not. And of course, what happened, you had the white flight, they would move to another community so the kids would not have to be assigned to a uh, minority school. In fact, in the Woodmere Park area, mostly whites live over there. And uh, after a few blacks moved in that area, they started uh, selling their homes and had cases where a person didn't have to make a down payment. They wanted to get out in such a hurry that uh, they sold it for maybe 20% less than the value of the house. You know, the attitude. Uh. Well, first of all, from the beginning, we weren't, we weren't coming at the public schools. We were there asking how we could help. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, one woman in particular whose name was Doris Hutchinson, who was a director of um, development for the Greensboro Public Schools at that time, helped us, you know, really write down what, what were the things that we could do. And then after we understood what we could do and how we could do it, we just sort of went around and did it. An eternal optimist. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and luckily my wife is too. So uh, we, we discussed it and, and, and of course talked to a lot of people about change and how things could be done and what we thought ought to be done. Uh, and uh, if you recall, I was in the legislature at that time. And uh, so I worked through that area. And probably uh, my wife Shirley and Joan Bledenthal had about as much to do with the smoothness with which the busing occurred after that as, as anybody else. They, they headed this group, and she could probably tell you more about it, but they headed this group uh, that said the bus stops here or something, I forgot. Multimedia video that was called The Bus Stops Here Eddie Booker, who was working with Burlington Industries at the time, was the, per the main person who helped to develop that video. And he was an expert. I think he has now media, uh, well, anyway, he has, a, he has a consultant firm now. But that video was developed and we carried it everywhere. And we developed bumper stickers and said something, uh, it's not where the bus stops, but what happens after the bus gets there. Something like that. It, it was a thing that we carried out, but the Chamber of Commerce worked very closely with those of us who were volunteering and trying to make sure that our children got the best that there could be. First, one of the things that we felt was that we needed to have some retreats for the, for the parents, teachers, administrators, and students. But they organized things so that black and white parents met during the summer and students met during the summer so that when the fall came, they would already have started working on having a smooth transition, transition uh, with, with integration. Who were had children in high school, it was a parent, teacher, and then uh, some students. But in the lower grades, you only had the parents, and we went to Chincopin. Before the schools were desegregated, uh, physically, desegregated and we were able to we went to the United Way and we went to the Chamber of Commerce and we asked them for enough money to pay for those retreats which became known as the Chinkapen retreats. To see if there could not be some basic understandings of what was to be expected and to find out that there was no difference in a human being. Uh, the color of their skin may have been different but everybody was seeking for the same thing and that was the best that there could be for their children so that they could be, be the best that they could be. And we went to Chincapin and developed those scenarios. Once we supplied the staff with the money they needed, we didn't try to plan the whole thing. They planned it and we helped them. And then we participated and we took any number of groups of parents uh, to Chincapin for an overnight experience. I can't remember now whether it was one or two nights. Uh, and it was, uh, we brought people who are very skilled in doing this kind of thing here from other parts of the country. 
came back and Greensboro, fortunately enough, was one of those school systems that never closed, those large school systems that didn't close. And I think one of the reasons that helped so much was the business community got involved. The Chamber of Commerce had discussion sales throughout the city and people got to see the importance of getting an education. These were our leaders that we were looking uh, li looking to. There were lots of, we were broken up into small groups and there were lots of different things going on depending upon what the group wanted. But we talked a lot about their fears, a lot about sharing fears. And they came out I and mean, it was very, very easy because people had lots of fears. And once, you know, once somebody would break the silence, it would, it would just come out naturally. And um, we had recorders in these little small sessions, and the sessions were always mixed. That is, there were administrators all the way down to the students, including the parents, and et cetera. And um, we would have recorders, and they would keep a record of what everybody was saying. And the more people talk about their fears, the less fearsome those emotions are. You know, and the more you sort of get the feeling that you're developing rapport with people who are different than you are and that you have the same fears. So the small group sessions were extremely important. Also, don't forget that these kids, the students were all living together overnight for two nights. Um, and then we had very large sessions where we just were, you know, were told to look at the person next to us and talk to them about kinds of things. And they did some touchy-feely kinds of things, which made everybody very uncomfortable. <laughs> But um, that worked out fine. We ate our meals together. It was, it was as much just being there with the kinds of people you had never known before from different parts of Greensboro and finding out how much you had in common. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they were able to articulate well some of the things that could be addressed. I, I don't think there's any problem that's too difficult to solve if you get a group of people who believe that you can solve it and then who are willing to do a little planning and a little advanced work and then go to work to get the job done. And uh, so I just, I think, I mean, that's my philosophy, you know, and, and that's, that's where I come from. And it was a really wonderfully successful program. Of course, we only touched a few of the many people who were involved in the public schools, but enough to um, help send out the message, you know, that things were going to be okay, that we could get along together. Um, we also had what we called a parent rap session. That one was very, very interesting because we, we suggested that no school administrator or no teacher be present. And the teachers got a little bit upset because they thought we were trying to muzzle them. But what we were trying to do was get parents to understand uh, and listen to what others were saying to see if it were true. Case in point, there was a student, uh, a parent who had a child at Grimsley High School. And, uh, and this was an African-American parent. And there were other African-Americans who were present too. And one mother said, they won't even let me go to the school to observe what my child is doing. And people, that is ridiculous. And finally one mother said, well, you know, I go every day. And she said, I work in the, uh, in the health room. We came to find out that the child didn't want her mother to come to the school for some reason. You know how high school students are sometimes. Uh, and then they found out later that it was open for everybody to come. If there had been a teacher or an administrator there, we didn't want them to be defensive or get anything out about it. So after it was all over with, you know, things went well, and this is not to suggest that there were not problems, but I tend to focus on positive things that happen in there and, and, and try to see what I can do to help with the negative negative forces. I don't know that there, I don't know how to describe it, just one important role, okay. but, so. but uh, the Human Relations Advisory Committee was, was indeed a bridge between the lay people, parents, and administrators who were, and board who were making, were making decisions. And when those decisions, when, when we felt, they felt that they fell in the realm of, of human relations, which actually most everything did, we would share with them the feelings of parents and our, and our group, which was representative of, of parents and children. If you communicate and if you talk to people, 
uh, I think it's much better than written form because sometimes our verbal language is in conflict with our body language. And um, I think many times when you are talking directly to people, then you see that both of those uh, languages are in sync with each other and you tend to agree with it. And it, there's just a difference when there is direct dialogue than in, in, in written dialogue. It was an experience I'm glad I had, and it's one that I think had a tremendous impact on Greensboro because there were so many parents. It wasn't just one person. It just wasn't one group of people. It was all of the people in, in, in Greensboro who wanted to make sure that Greensboro, now whether they liked it or not, but it was one of the things that the law had said that we must integrate our schools and we were going to be the best that there could be in helping to develop uh, to, uh, to cause that to happen. We also oversaw and got volunteers for many of the activities which I previously described. Um, the information center at the central office, the, the bus aides, um, and um, setting up uh, smaller committees within each school, human relations committees in each school to deal with human relations problems in those schools and knowing that they could then come to us if they couldn't solve those problems. So it was just a sort of shotgun thing. It was a, a multi-projection uh, of, of um, all of the challenges that were involved in this whole process and uh, having a central clearing bureau, so to speak. And children were supposed to go to the schools closest to them. We got together and went and integrated couples, a, a black person and a white person, and went to homes of those persons nearest the school system and said, if, uh, when school opens, would you allow your child to go to X school? And we developed an integrated uh, kindergarten or first grade, kindergarten first and second grades, at Bennett College's children's house. It was a great experience where parents got together and, and, and sent some of their children to school. When we started, so that when the retreats were over and we started bringing children to different schools, there were things in place that they themselves had suggested, you know, like having, having somebody extra on buses, um, a parent or an older person on every bus to, to see to it that everything went all right. Because you can imagine if you were putting a small child on a bus and they were going all the way across town to a place you'd never been to before, how you would feel. Uh, we also managed to have open, that they suggested and we did have open houses for, for everybody so that everybody got a chance to go to the school that they were going to be assigned to. And the parents got a chance to see and meet people, that kind of thing. To the very business of have it went from that to, to uh, very serious uh, fiscal implications, things that we needed to do, and who was going to pay for them, how are we going to pay for them? And um, things like moving, just moving, physically moving uh, small chairs to, uh, from, a, from an elementary school to another elementary school where there were, the little children were going to be, and the, that, and the uh, original uh, school that was supplying the small chairs was now going to become a middle school, you know, that kind of thing. Just, Everything you can possibly think about that we could possibly address, we did. Uh, we also had an information, I remember that we had an information center at the, at the uh, administration building where any parent could call at any time to ask any question they wanted to or to, to ask for more help with whatever their problem was. I think generally we just tried to, to continue to develop the spirit of Chinkapen in every school. That's what it was about. And the Chamber of Commerce and the United Way were extremely helpful in all of that. You know, we didn't have, we did not, hit the whites uh, didn't want their kids bus. I had something, I, I don't know if you had copy of it or not. I had a uh, statement I made once about uh, nobody complaining about busing. I was saying that uh, nobody complained about busing uh, before when the blacks had to be bused beyond their schools to black school, passing white school, nobody complained. Busing was not an issue. But when they turned around and said, white kids going to have to be bused, then it becomes something that's not right to have to do this kind of thing. 
but uh, I think uh, for the most part, our, 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 I believe most of our people accepted the fact that this is something because if you're going to have integration, you have to do some busting. Now, you know, the wise thing that could have done, I said to several persons speaking after it happened, I said, if y'all had done the right thing 20 or 30 years ago in housing, then you could have had neighborhood school. If you had done the right thing, but you want us to live over in the community, <laughs> public housing, but I say, if you had done the right thing back there, you wouldn't have a problem because you could have neighborhood schools. I have no idea because we each took our own little area. I mean, I was chairman of it, but everybody had their own little area and there were so many people involved that today I can't even tell you. I have no idea. what We never <laughs> counted and people probably never got adequately thanked either, but, they, but I don't think they needed that. It's what, in college I learned the word psychic income, which means, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, people felt good about what they were doing and they did it, but there were hundreds of people involved. And always, I, I want to be sure that people know that always the Chamber of Commerce was, was there being helpful. And they themselves had programs going under the direction of Hal Sieber um, and a committee from the Chamber that were sort of backing us up. I, I did not actually pull people into the process. First of all, it was not only women, it was, there were lots of men involved in this. Um, I'd, and I was never conscious of working the network. I didn't even know what network meant. I, it was such a, it was, it was such an important moment in the history of this community that you didn't have to play games with people or you, you could just say, you know, to a newspaper reporter, we really need some men to move the furniture or we, we really need some people to get on those buses and see the things are safe or whatever we were talking about, whatever we're talking about, everybody was really glad to do whatever needed. I mean, there'll never be another chance like that again in terms of pulling people together because people just came together. Nobody could possibly take credit for that. It was the moment. It was the importance of it. And, and after all, you'd be surprised how easy it is, or I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised at how easy it is to bring people together when you're talking about and doing something with their children particularly when they don't have control over that. So it was just somebody being there at the moment and saying, and, and articulating some of the needs. And I, I, I hope I'm not conveying to you the idea that it was just me because it was so many people um, that, that took leadership roles in so many areas. But we did have the comfort of being able to come together and talk about them together, problem solve together. Well, Shirley Fry and I, and there were probably some other people I don't remember anymore without looking back at my records. Um, but Shirley did a lot of the talking. We just simply told them that if, if the desegregation of the schools was unsuccessful and children were hurt as a result of it, they would be responsible. Because we needed that money to, to do the things we needed to do to prepare for those children carefully. And without it, we couldn't do it. And one of the things we did do is to bring teachers back a week early. You know, that was a big expense. But, um, I mean, we just, as, as they say, put it to them. And uh, they very responsibly replied. And it was not, it was not that difficult. Again, they were, they were another kind of bridge. They bridged into the business community where the, you know, and that, that was very important so that, again, we would have the financial support we needed and we would also have the understanding from people who made decisions. There are a lot of decision makers in the Chamber of Commerce and they can affect legislation, they can affect um, the ability to, of, of any group to get funds. They're you know, a successful group and they can also help us. And some of the corporations in later years, as a result of all that, adopted schools and tried to um, assess and analyze the strength and strengths and weaknesses of a particular school and address them as they would um, in their own businesses. And that was very, very interesting and successful. And Alex Spears, who was a, with Laura Lard Corporation, um, had, a, had a, a very good program that he did of one of the, one of the middle schools and just uh, sort of turned it upside down and put it back together again. And it was off and running in a most 
much more effective way. So I guess it was just reaching out to as many effective organizations as we could to let them know what was happening. I think the worst thing is the, rumor, the rumors that, that start when you're doing anything so massive. People hear something and it's, it's somebody's thought and then it becomes a fact and then it becomes a problem and it may not even exist as a problem. So all of those organizations which came together helped ease that problem. And the people of my country in my time In my time, in my time Wars played on TV Sound bites on manifest destiny But all I saw was cruelty and misery And confusion in the vision of my time In my time, in my time